This podcast is rated E for explicit. Singer, songwriter, activist, and producer Larry Carter, also known as Philly, is the real deal. Generous, genuine, and courageous. And as you will hear in our interview, candid. He came into the room, like we were in the room and he came into the room. And I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, and then he's like, no, y'all keep on, y'all keep on, do what you're doing. Um, and then he, he tried to penetrate me. Stay tuned. You met me in the midst of many things. Shedding skin sprout wings looking at life as a spiritual being through a human lens having conversations with God about so many things this show is your invitation the poet God is the conversation Washington Post poll revealing an estimated 33 million American women have been sexually harassed and an estimated... A year ago, in the heat of the Me Too movement, when story after story was breaking from women who were victimized by powerful men, I was inspired to write a poem called Men Too because I knew that although it may not be as common a story, men and boys are victimized in similar ways by male and female predators alike but those stories are not as commonly told. So naturally, when the opportunity came for me to host and produce this podcast, I knew that telling those stories would be one of my main priorities. Thankfully, after speaking with Mr. Carter about the idea, he agreed to tell his story and help me start a movement of our own, the Men Too movement. So throughout this episode, you will hear that poem called Men Too, that tells the stories of men just like you. We were talking about why it's important to be able to tell the truth yeah. and to have that kind of raw honesty. And earlier you had said um, something that I like to you know, say all the time, and, and, and it's part of the gospel that I preach, <laughs> which is that vulnerability is actually a strength. It is. And it's a very, very powerful thing. Um, and if you have not created a space in your community, um, in your household, where your friends, your significant other, whomever, can feel like they can open up their heart to you, then that's a big problem. Then you kind of have to question, well, how authentic are these relationships? And if I can find my truth within this space and tell my truth within this space. See, that's tricky. Um, so uh, I think thinking about vulnerability, though, mm -hmm. a lot of people have been taught indirectly not to be vulnerable. Especially us men. Yeah, uh, because it's like that's weak or like right. you're soft. And, and right. so people kind of hide it and it makes it hard to um, really foster real relationships with people in general mm -hmm. um, when you're not vulnerable. Right. I mean, I've had I've had to work through my own issues of vulnerability. Um, and that just comes, I think. Mental health is a, a large part of that because the experiences you collect mm -hmm. um, through your life stay with you. Like pieces of that shape you. Right. Um, and not managing or not handling or debriefing or understanding what that is and how it happened and understanding your part or, or 
whatever, it, it kind of keeps you from being vulnerable because mm-hmm. that's something else you're hiding. It's like you have all of these secrets. Right. So do you draw a link between someone's mental health or how healthy someone's um, mental health is um, to ha- their willingness to be vulnerable? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. I feel like um, it's kind of like you've been hurt. You're hurt. Right. Emotionally, mm-hmm. um, which controls your thoughts and your actions. Mm-hmm. So those those things play out in your behavior. So mentally, you might not even see reality as it is because of your hurt. Right. So fear and hurt kind of sometimes guide people's actions. You think about things differently. You respond to things differently. It's basically controlling you. Mm-hmm. Your mental state is controlled by your pain and your hurt. Right, right. Um, and it seems like especially for men because we have been um, expected to be here be, to behave a certain way. And consequently, we, I think, lack the tools, some of us, mm-hmm. to unwind ourselves from that pain. Definitely. You know, I feel like so this goes even deeper. So when you think about especially when I think about black men um, in general or black people in general, um, his history shows you like all of the pain and hurt that we've been through. And sometimes that keeps you. It's like you got to be strong to make it through. You just got to make it through for your family. You got to make it through for this. Right. For that right. you don't have time to even right. take care of self, mm-hmm. you know, so you neglect yourself. And a lot of our parents neglected themselves and we watched them neglect themselves, whether it's to take care of us or right. to make sure we have what we need. They neglect themselves. So in turn, we grow up neglecting ourselves, trying to be this for someone else or trying to be that for someone, whoever uh, a mate or a friend or whatever, and you, you kind of are abandoning yourself. So even though you have all of these friends and people around you, you still feel lonely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and you you begin to kind of like disappear mm-hmm. within that loneliness. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you come to. I think for me, um, I kind of came to a, just a dead end, literally, just a dead end where I was like, you know what, I cannot do this anymore. Um, and especially as it relates to having been um, molested as a child and having gone through that um, and feeling like I had to protect mm-hmm. Uh, mm. other people who were involved in that um, and carrying the weight of that. I, I carried it until I couldn't carry it anymore. I carried it until it was a choice between continuing to carry it. And not continuing at all. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to continue without it. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, that was the beginning of a rebirth. I don't know if you know, but I'm 10 years old. Because 10 years ago, (laughs) I had a rebirth when I was 27. And so I feel like I'm 10 years into this new person that I've now given myself the permission to be. And so um, I feel responsible uh, to tell the truth about um, that kid, my grandmother nicknamed Kilo, uh, who I was, you know, as a a child and what he been, what he was, uh, what he had to go through, what he had to suffer through. And, um, and I feel empowered to that because I don't care about the things that he used to care about. Uh, and so one of the reasons why I wanted to do this uh, series um, is to talk about people um, like myself, to talk about and talk with people who had suffered some of the same things that I suffered through. Because I think um, being able to tell those stories and tell the truth about what it was and, and, and share with people what that experience looks like from the person who went through it directly is, is a very powerful thing. And so I'm, fa- I'm, 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 I'm so excited that you're here. <laughs> so thank you. I'm happy to be here. More with Mr. Carter when we return. Hey, guys. I'm Joseph, a member of the board, which is what Akil refers to as his community of friends and supporters. We all have something valuable to give. 
and sometimes it's as simple as giving someone else a reason to live. On behalf of all the board members, I want to thank you for listening to our podcast. Akil's success is our success, and we want you to be a part of the community we are building. It's not enough. It's not enough. Because you are the very foundation we must build it on. It's not enough to tell people that they matter. We have to show them. Like my friends showed me. So tell a friend, leave a review, and keep in touch. We want to hear from you because it all matters. Just as you do. I was sexually abused as a child. Mm -hmm. And like I really didn't talk about it at all. Um, you know, and the funny thing was, is like, like you, I had moved away and I started my own life. And then I don't know, it was a shift in me. Um, I went home and I told my mom and I told my sisters, um, Hmm. and we all sat there and had a moment and like, they cried and asked questions of like, why? Because it was, this happened like when I was six. Six years old, okay. And so um, it was somebody who was around, close to the family. A family friend. And um, and and the, the thing about it was that um, he wasn't like an adult. He was like a teenager. Okay. You know, so that was like a, a whole uh, weird... Dynamic? Dynamic going, you know, because it's like, so this is another child doing this to a child... Um, but it the thing about it is that it spanned a time frame, mm-hmm. like years. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, from like when I was six to about the time that I was eight. Okay. And I feel like um, he either thought I he thought I was old enough to tell and know that it wasn't okay. So then it transitioned to like whenever he would come around, he would like beat me up. Hmm. You know, and like a playful way, but like kind of beat me up, like almost like to um, like wrestling. Yeah, but but more because because okay. like I was smaller, he was bigger, right? And then like to almost instill the fear of like I could hurt you. Oh, I see. You see what I'm saying? I see. Like I see. it was a whole mental game of like I could hurt you, so hmm. don't right. type of thing, you right. know, and um. Like, I held it for a long time. And I, I think about the Me Too movement and everything, and everybody's always saying, well, why did you wait so long? And why didn't you say something? And that's my mom asking me. She asked me, like, why didn't you tell me? And I, similar to you, I was like, I did. I wanted to protect you. Mm. Because I knew if I told you, it would shift who you are. It would shift how you deal with this person and people connected to this person. So this person is still a big part of the family? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so you know what I'm saying. So right. it's like it's not like right. somebody who just went away. This is somebody that's still, you know, around. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I'm just like I. Did you see that person when you went back to uh, visit your family? Um, not that time, but I have I have seen him. Did you? Uh, were you Were you able to ever? Like, we never had a conversation about it. Okay. But I'm like, you know. Yeah, of and course. I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, I don't even... Um, I don't even desire or need that from him or anything. Because I know you know better. Right. And I know you know what happened and, and what the whole thing. Um, and, like, my mom was just like, well, what do you want me to do? And I was like, I don't want you to do anything. I just needed to release this because I'm... The, I've been carrying this around with me everywhere I go. Right. You know, and now this is my time to put it down. You can do with it whatever you want to do with it. I'm not asking you to do anything. I just need to release it. Right. And that's kind of where I was um, with that because that, (laughs) so that has been like, and and you know, the thing, um, when I think about Oprah and her story, how it happened several times throughout her life. It's happened to me several times throughout my life in different ways, in different phases. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so I, when I started college, when I was like 17, mm-hmm. that's when I got to the point where I guess I was like exploring. Right. Um, and I was still living at home because I didn't want to stay on campus because if I did, 
then I would have a curfew and all of this other stuff. Oh, I see. And you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so Not as much freedom? Not as much freedom. And not saying that I was wanted to stay out late, because it wasn't. But I just... I just didn't feel comfortable. Right. You know, um, and so like I was on this app, like, uh, like trying to like meet somebody mm-hmm. like my age or whatever. So, um, I did, I, so I went and it was like late. So I went to like sneak to, um, meet this guy that was my age that I was interested in or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, he was like, Oh, come, come over. And I was like, well, you know, I pull up to the house. I'm like, it's like a huge house or whatever. And I'm like, okay, are your parents home? What is this? He was like, I don't live with my parents. So I come in and like, we're talking, whatever. Like, in like, we were kissing or whatever, or messing around, just mm-hmm. kind of exploring. However, the homeowner, which was um, a successful, um, I guess, like he was involved in the church. Oh. In the area. So like he okay. in a mega church in the area. Is so that right? he came into the room. Like we were in the room and he came into the room. In the middle of uh, Yeah. Okay. So and I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure what's going on. So you know, like my radar is just like, okay. Right. So I try to um and then he's like, No, y'all keep on, y'all keep on. Do what you're doing. Um and then he he was like, um, oh, get on the bed, lay on top of him, lay, telling me to lay on top of him or whatever. And I was like, nah. He's like, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So being stupid and a teenager, I did. And, uh-huh. um, and so in the midst, he tried to like penetrate me, uh, like pull my clothes down and penetrate me while this other little. So right. I'm assuming that like that's probably what they do. But he did not. Um, mm-hmm. But like even that piece, that right. happening, um, it kind of shifted yeah. my ex- my sexual experience because it was like to me, like penetration now became like this power struggle because like I literally had to physically struggle to, to prevent out. yeah to prevent mm. that from happening and get out of there and I got my stuff and I left and I, like this is the first time besides my husband that I've actually share that with anybody wow. because I was I didn't know uh hmm. I didn't really know what to do but that, um, yeah. because it was like I did, hadn't told my family um that I was interested in guys and like I just was in a really confused space right and that just throttled me even further into confusion coming up There's a word that Mr. Carter absolutely hates, and maybe you do too. But first, the poem that inspired it all. Here is Men Too. I was 10 years old. When I was wondering what this lady's obsession was with my heir. She would choose a seat in church where she could reach to prepare. Fondling was her thing. And uh, with her kids sitting next to her, she couldn't stop herself from the suffering she would bring. The first time I was sexually violated, it was by a woman in a dark place. Now, here I was, being violated, out in the open, in front of the altar of grace. Some people gave her the side eye, and some gave her the blind one. You know, it's funny what blind eyes see. They saw what happened to me. I was 11 years old, riding my bike to the store alone, when some man pulled off alongside the road. He wanted to let me know that he thought my ass was gold. 
How is an 11 year old supposed to measure that the sight of his ass brings men pleasure? I was 14 years old, walking up the staircase at church and walking down was an older youth. He abruptly took my hand and put it on his flute. He hardly ever said a word to me, but where no one could watch, he decided that my hand should meet his crotch. I was 17 years old. School and work was my routine. Often on the journey in between, I was followed and whistled at. Some white folks in Texas wanted to know, is it true what they say about you blacks? I was 21 years old, sitting in a government office in a land where my writing career had began, invited there by a government official who wanted to lend a hand. So why did it feel like I was a rat in a serpent's plan, asking it to retract the fangs that were his hands? Him letting go left memories I had no room for. Then they became the enemy I had no tomb for. You don't know what you do to me, he said as if it was my fault that he was unable to bring his lusting to a halt. The checks he wrote was supposed to be of no cost to me, but the hugs he gave left me feeling like they were anything but free. I was 23 years old, hosting my own radio talk show on Sunday nights. My first stalker had been calling my job all week long. He said, I don't take no for an answer. I never met him, his wife, or his kids, but from a distance, he was my cancer. Rich, powerful, and too arrogant to comprehend no. He camped out at the radio station one night and tried to follow me home. And it seemed like all my life, this reality is all I've ever known. Now he holds one of the most powerful positions in that government. And what I hold is a filthy lie of a covenant. It is why we don't tell, not knowing that when we do, it breaks the spell. I wished that this was the half, but it is barely the quarter. All my life I've dealt with these issues from men and women and not in that order. I wish that when I was 10, 11, 14, 17, 21, and 23, that someone told their story so that I could say, me too. It was years before I knew that I wasn't alone. And years after that, until I was strong enough to tell the story that is my own. I am 37 now, and as we speak, I am still dealing with some of those same issues. This Me Too movement that we're having now is great. But women everywhere need to know that not only women can relate. I understand what it is to be sexually harassed by both a woman and a man. I wanted to write this in support of you, Mr. Carter, and every man who now feels empowered to raise his voice and his hand. To say, men too. your life you've tried to be a good man inside did everything that you thought you should didn't seem to do you any good Ooh, I know you
Continue our conversation with Mr. Carter. When you come out of an experience like that, um, do you kind of think to yourself, um, do you kind of blame yourself? How did how did I end up in this situation? Well, why did you do? Why did you go? You why did you known go? Better. You know, and um, did you it, don't. <laughs> did it bring back memories of the child molestation, the it, childhood thing? It does. It was, well, see, the childhood thing, it was more, it wasn't as forced, mm-hmm. you know? So it was more like a, hey, you know, I mean, this is somebody that I grew up with. Right. So, like, we took baths together. Right. Type right. of thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. So. It was like more of a trusted person where this, this was somebody a, I did not trust. Right. So it was like it. And the, and the person that you um, were meeting, this was the first time that you were meeting right. him too. Right. Right. Oh, I see. So you see. So it was like, and that's that whole piece of the whole DL thing that is so unsafe. Mm-hmm. And I just, um, I know it's hard to come out and be vulnerable. I know that is a really tough thing from my own experiences and just because I moved past it and I'm past that era, I don't think it's easy for somebody else because of it's not. Of course. Of you course. Know? But it, there's so much danger in it because so many things can happen to you. Yeah. And nobody even knows where you are or who you're with or what. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I as, you, as you're saying that, I was thinking about a friend of mine who... Um, was recently mm-hmm. in a situation where um, he had to really kind of think about how he was going to approach a family member who was on 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 the app, one of those apps, and mm-hmm. um, it was for that reason. Uh, it was for the reason was is is that this this is a dangerous. It you know it can be, and if you're if you don't know what you're getting into, um, you know. Because of the nature of how things happen in the community, um, people don't feel like they can be themselves and uh, be share that part of their life with people. Because obviously, you know, they're gonna they feel they're gonna be judged. They don't want to be judged. Uh, but on the other side of that coin, you have the, these predators mm-hmm. who take advantage mm-hmm. of your unwillingness to you know be. Um, "Quote unquote out, um, and 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 you can you can be in between a rock and a hard place um, in regards to that, and that's that that's that's what you know your your story kind of reminds me of. Um, so it did it feel in the, in a moment like you were like you had been set up, or did it feel like this the the, the person who was with you um, was a was uh, also being." Um, Violated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I I think he was being violated too. Like he hit me up later and was like, "I'm sorry oh, that I happened." See. I um, see. I didn't, but I didn't care. <laughs> like at that point, I was over it. And I, I I definitely feel like he probably was somebody who was put out of his house for being gay. Oh. And this is where he found refuge. Oh, I see. You see, I so see. it's it's so tricky. That um, so it's not really he's a predator, but he's he's prey that's just trying to survive. Right. You see what I'm saying? And this person who has resources is using his resources to prey on people who don't have resources, which I mean, that's just one of those things that I, I have. I take issue with. And I think maybe that's why I take issue with it from my personal experience. But. I refuse to support anybody who I see use their resource or power 
to take advantage of someone who doesn't have the resources. That's why that Eddie Long situation kind of just really pissed me off because I was having so much triggers, Mm -hmm. (laughs) for lack of a better word, from hearing those stories from, from those guys. And of course, you know, people will say that, oh, their stories wasn't proven or they were... Um, they knew what they were getting into and all of this kind of stuff. But um, it's easy to say that when you're not um, walking in their shoes, you don't understand what it's like to be um, in need and vulnerable. And getting back to this whole thing about, um, as we've been talking about, um, toxic masculinity, you know, the fact that we have all of these issues to deal with as men does not negate from the fact that we still have these needs, Mm -hmm. uh, these emotional needs, Mm -hmm. regardless of what society says we're supposed to be. And we're supposed to act like within that, these needs still have to be met Mm -hmm. or we suffer in some way. and, And the people who we interact with on some level, We'll suffer. Our relationships suffer. Our mental health Mm -hmm. suffers because we still are human beings who happen to be men, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? And I think the tricky part about that and and something you said triggered a thought for me is it's a need. So it's like it's like this. If I can't eat at home, I'll go hunt and find something to eat. Right. I'm going to feel that need, that void that I have. It might not be the safest or most healthy way, but I'm going to feel that boy. And I feel like a lot of people ignore that. Um, people need connection. And, yeah. and something you said, too, is like about the app. That's a part. Everybody has sex. Right. Well, most people, some people don't. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people do. And, and, <laughs> and But it's so villainized. Like, sex is such a bad thing or you're such a bad person because you have sex. So it makes people almost shame to have sex. So they, they have these secret sexual lives. And then it becomes this this hidden thing that they do. That makes it unsafe. Right. Where you could, if you could be sexually um, active with however you choose to be, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and not be shamed for your sexual being, I think um, that's a huge part because people want to be accepted. So mm-hmm. if it means that this need that I have will cause me not to be accepted. I'm going to hide it as long as I can and not do it as long as I can. But when I get the urge to do it, I might do it in an unsafe way. Whether that means I'm meeting somebody on an app that I don't know that could be a mugger that's going to shoot me and kill me. Or I am I meet somebody and have unprotected sex because I don't, I can't buy a condom. So, because I don't, have, whatever your reasoning or thinking somebody's going to find out and you have unprotected sex, which is not safe. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these different things come about because of this shame. Like DL men stay DL because of this shame. This shame causes them to unsafe behaviors because mentally, uh, you know, it's like I can lose my whole everything that I am and ever known since I was alive. I can lose all of that because of this one piece of me. Right. That's scary. You know what I'm saying? It's like people people don't like it when I do this, but when when I think about slavery, mm-hmm. it's one master on the plantation and all of these slaves. Why wouldn't they just kill them and live on the plantation and act like everything is okay? Mm-hmm. Why not? Because the mental fear of what could happen. Right. It's not even something that has happened. It's the fear of the possibility is so negative that I can't even fathom trying to live a better life or trying to be authentically me because of the fear of this worst thing that could destroy me. Yeah. And anybody, you know, talking about slavery, if you um, watched uh, Many Rivers to Cross, which was an awesome documentary um, that really goes into a lot of depth in, into what the culture of things were like. And actually, um, you kind of get a kind of visceral feel of what it was like to be alive during that time, you know. And I, I remember watching a couple of episodes of that and I just wept 
at night after watching that because it just stuck with me. Um, I thought about what those people's lives were like. Um, I thought about how they never got to love the way they wanted to love. They, you know, where today we have the privilege to be having issues uh, on the table, such as, you know, gay marriage and all of that kind of stuff. They couldn't even conceive of expressing love to the same sex at, at that time. You know what I'm saying? We mm-hmm. had much bigger issues to talk about, <laughs> you know? I mean, they couldn't even... Men and women, African-American men and women couldn't even marry, so... Right, exactly. It, so it was like you weren't even considered a full person. Person, yeah. But much like today, and I mean, I um, I definitely want to say uh, for trans men and trans women also, that is something that I just am very... Um, and passionate about mm-hmm. uh, because I feel like they go through a similar struggle where people dehumanize them. Of course, absolutely. Because they don't walk their walk. And it's like, I don't understand. No, I don't know what it's like. No, but I know that you're a person just like I, I am. I know that you're a human being. And that that is all that should matter. That's it. Yeah. But you know what? Talking about, um, you know, uh, trans souls, um, trans America. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. I haven't. You have to see it. Okay, I'll take it out. You have to see it. Trans America just changed my life. It changed the way I looked at the trans community. Um, I think that movie did more uh, for humanizing that community than anything that I've ever seen. Um, and so I was I was really happy. Felicity Huffman uh, played a, a trans um, woman. Uh, in it, and I think she did an amazing job, and so I highly recommend anybody who, you know, uh, wants to maybe challenge themselves to look at the community in a different light. You should watch Trans America, you know. Um, and talking about that, because uh, th- one of the things that I feel like I have to keep saying and repeating to people is that if you don't understand a particular community. There's no excuse for ignorance. You don't have to agree with anybody's quote unquote lifestyle. Um, I, I hate that word too. I hate that word. Don't you? So much. T- you know I, what? It annoys me. Well, tell me why. Like, what hate- the fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, what? Oh, what does God. that mean? Oh. There is like when people say, "Oh, the gay lifestyle." Like, the, so what you're saying is every person that is gay lives the exact same way. Yeah. No, that's you know what absolutely I ha- incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it because it sounds to me in some way like you're marginalizing mm-hmm. that group of people. You are. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, almost like um like uh how women in the south say um oh bless her heart. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> it is. It is because it's like oh the the black lifestyle. What the fuck is that? Like you yeah. know what I'm saying? You would be upset if somebody said that to you, especially and, and oh, I don't. I, you know, I don't agree with your lifestyle. I don't agree with the black lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, that's what racists say all the time, pretty much. What, what you know the what fuck I'm saying? is my lifestyle? <laughs> so I'm just breathing. Saying, it's like you loving, you know, because you don't know how to. I think <sighs> just because <laughs> you know, take a breath. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's frustrating because it's like it's just my life. Like I'm living life just like you're living life. So nobody ever says, you know, I just don't agree with the straight lifestyle. Like, what the fuck? Right. I mean, excuse my No, life, this is I a podcast. I don't cuss, but this is a it podcast. is like, what the fuck does that mean? Right. Like, do you even hear yourself? And then like, oh, oh, no, I mean, you know, you know. No, I don't know. Because guess what? My experiences have given me something different. So I don't put anybody in a box. I, I have friends from every facet of the earth and it's just like they are who they are and no right. two are exactly the same when i think about it, i have this friend named ann she's a, a white straight woman mm-hmm. totally opposite of what i am <laughs> <laughs> and we have um we have a lot of similarities 
not because we we uh, went to undergrad, mm-hmm. same program. We went to our master's program, same program. We worked at the same school. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of shared experiences through life. So we see things similarly because our shared experiences, not because she's white or I'm black or whatever. It's like, yeah, there are some things that are shared in different communities. But at the same time, we all have different experiences. So attributing me being gay to me having a certain quote unquote lifestyle is ignorant, it's limiting, and it's belittling my life in general. Oh yeah. You absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And, and I just you know, I, I I had to let you express that because <laughs> if you didn't I would have had to do it. And I'm glad that you did it. <laughs> no, because it's something that um that I hear all the time. It's like one of those kind of go-to phrases that uh, people who are straight um, say to people who are gay and they don't realize that it's uh, it's offensive and it's disrespectful and um, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to... I don't expect you. I don't require you to understand it. I don't expect you to understand it. It's not a part of your universe. That's fine. However... Um, if you want to be a better human being, then you should do the work to educate yourself about what another human experience may be like. Because it's very lazy and easy to sit in your corner of wherever you are and whatever your life has exposed you to and speak to other people's life and um, other people's you know, situation that you have no idea about. So if you're going to speak about it, if you're going to have an opinion about it, at least have an informed opinion. Come to the conversation with an open heart Mm -hmm. and be willing to uh, look in and walk as closely as you possibly can into the life of another human being and and be able to see if you could find your own truth in there. Mm -hmm. Because I I really believe what my Angelo always says, which is that we are more alike than we are unalike. Mm-hmm. And there are no aliens here. <laughs> you know, they, we are all, you know, human beings trying to figure out how to love better, how to connect, how to be as happy as, you know, we possibly can. And getting in, why would you want to get in the way of somebody's pursuit of happiness? You know, um, and so... I also hate the term, you know, in the closet, coming out, whatever. Because like I said to somebody else the other day, um, I'm not in anybody's closet. (laughs) Um, And I feel like when you say that, you give people more power than they deserve. If I'm in a closet, it's the one that I put myself in. Right. You know, Uh, it's not the one that anybody else put me in. Um, But as I was kind of making that point, I also said that... um, we don't ask straight people to come out of the closet. No. We don't ask, uh, you know, and, and but we allow them to ask us, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, we give them that kind of power in our life. And I feel like if you're doing that, then you're in some way co-signing how they feel about you, you know? And that's, that's interesting because um, as a married man... Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll go places and people will see my ring and make comments like, oh, your wife, da 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 You know? And I'm like, I don't have a wife. I mean, I don't have a wife. I have a husband. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like the look on their face. You manage that. That's not mine to manage. <laughs> like, that's not mine. That's yours. So I love it. It is. And then it's like, well, I, I didn't know. I, that's not my problem. Right. Like, you manage it. I, I'm i just telling you so you don't make the same mistake twice. Because if you say it again, then I'll be, it'll be offensive. Okay, you say you didn't. I'm just going to correct you. Right. But you feeling some way about it has nothing to do with me. That's everything to do with you and the work that you need to do. And I don't feel like I need to carry that burden. Right. Right. It's you know? not yours to carry. Again, you know. People need to take responsibility for the energy that they bring to other people. You know? I agree. And you need to be aware of how people experience you. Yeah. You know? And that is... <laughs> that's something funny. You need to high five me on that one? <laughs> yes. Okay. Exactly. How people experience you because people do not realize 
what they put out sometimes. And it's so interesting to me. Um, it really is because I really try my best to be like a genuine and kind person. Right. Just in general. Right. You know, to right. people I know, people I don't know. Right. And I feel like some people put forth a lot of energy to not be. And it's it doesn't yeah. it doesn't fulfill you like because you're still unhappy. Yeah. You know, and I, I just don't understand that. Um so it's this person um that was like, Hey, I wanna be friends with you or whatever. Right. Like people say that all the time and like I ignore it most of the time because I feel like people don't genuinely mean it. You mean that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I ignore it a lot of the time. So I was like, okay. Was this uh, the person who said they wanted to be friends with you? Was it like uh, through online or was it somebody? Yeah, it was somebody like online that was like, yeah, I seen you around or whatever. And I feel like you cool. I want to be cool with you. Gotcha. I was like, okay, cool. So um, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to this campaign rally, whatever. And this was recent. Um, Mm -hmm. Invited them to come. They didn't come um, or whatever. And like I was traveling for work and then I was like, oh, let me just check and say what's up. And I was like, hey, what's up? Just checking in to see how you doing. And they were like, who is this? And I was like, I was like, this is Larry. And I don't know Larry. And I was like, you know. Wait a minute. And I was like, you know, I was about to dismiss it. And I was like, you know what? I was about to dismiss this, but I'm going to say you actually asked me to be a friend to you. I'm genuinely checking on you as a person to see how you're doing, to see if you're still breathing. And this is how you respond. Well, I like my friends to talk every day. Yeah, right. So that's your expectation. And that's something that you'll have to deal with. But (laughs) again, like, because that's not my responsibility. And I used to take on those things right. like as my responsibility but it's not that's right. you and i just think if you are one of those people that do that stop cuz you don't really hurt the other person you make yourself look like a fool cuz you talk about you don't have friends and then you act like an asshole right. that's why you don't have friends right right that's you're you're searching for this connection but you're cutting off people who will generally genuinely connect with you because you feel like you have this unrealistic expectation. Manage your expectations of other people. Right. You know, um, <laughs> uh, we, that that reminds me of what we what we what we what we were talking about when you first got here, which is about community mm-hmm. and the importance of community and why we have these issues um, connecting with each other and forging genuine friendships. You know, and it's it's a unfortunately it's. It's it's a big issue, I think, with within the community. It goes back to masculinity, though vulnerability. Because yeah. really, what you what you want to say is, I'm disappointed that we don't talk, and I would like to talk to you more more often. And and if you were to just verbalize it like that, it right. would come across so differently. It would, because yeah. then I would be like, oh wow, I'm sorry, I had no idea. You know what? I'll try to do better. Right. You know. Yeah. That that changes the whole tone and the whole vibe. But when you come off negatively it's like like i owe you something i i don't owe you anything and i don't have to be bothered with right. you cuz my life is full without you right and and you know the other thing is it's almost like the people who not that we all don't have these the need for friendship and companionship and all that but it seems like the people who um have need for it the most are the people who are the least able to maintain those kind of connections. I was thinking that earlier. You read my thoughts. I, I, <laughs> I agree. It, it's true because they don't know how. They've never learned how to foster and maintain those connections. And I feel like early on, I was one of them. I, I didn't really know. It. I never acted negatively. I went in the other direction. I was a people pleaser. Right. Because I didn't know how to foster and maintain those connections. So I was breaking my neck to please everybody to try to connect with them. Mm-hmm. When um, And like I remember when I was 15, my friend, my best friend, Nikila, she still is to today. Mm-hmm. She was like, you need to learn to say no. <laughs> Just say no. She was like, you need to tell people no. Because yeah. you say yes too often. It's no way, and it, it you overextend yourself. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I, 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 I can totally relate to that. Um, as a person who has, I felt always given people too much more than I had to give, and you kind of bankrupt yourself in a in the process mm-hmm. of trying to be someone to someone or to too many people that you can't. So yeah, 
Yeah. This it's, it's definitely a thing. Yeah. And then yeah, there's a lot of people that are like that who when they feel bankrupt or they feel empty, mm-hmm. then they lash out and are like, um, don't nobody care about me and ain't no real people and all of this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, first of all, if you... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, don't post about... Like, don't... You don't have to post that. Like, if that's how you feel, then talk to your community. Talk to the people close to you. Because what that projects into the world that is watching is like, you're a sad person and I don't want to be bothered with you. The mind. You know, the one of the, one of the things that um, I had to do for myself to kind of over to deal with depression better is to redecorate my mind Mm -hmm. my mind had to be a place that i wanted to live in because hello that's where i live Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's where we all live is in that space of our minds and um so i had to kind of be intentional about what energy i allowed there and who I um, had friendships with, who I had again within my community, um, and 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 who I had on the board. By the way, the board is is people that I refer to as my friends, <laughs> um, people who you know are supporters on of what I do on different levels. Uh, and so the board, I take very seriously of people who are on the board because. These are people who I can go to and talk about, um, you know, everything that I want to talk to. I can be my whole self with them. I don't have to be half alive. You know, mm-hmm. I, I can uh, tell the truth and be vulnerable with the board. And on the other side of that, I challenge myself to create a space where they can do the same. Mr. Carter and I spoke about so much more. And if you're new... Subscribe and stay tuned for part two. I'm Akil Johnson, the poet god. Thank you for listening.